Hi, hi, lovely to see everybody. Fantastic. Um, good afternoon, Adrian. How are you? I'm well, thank you very much. Speaking all the way from the south coast of the UK. A Terrific. great pleasure to be here and to, to see all of your wonderful faces in this uh, screen in front of me. <clears throat> Fantastic. Okay, so let's 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 begin. I'm going to just share the screen for, for one second. Uh, let me just, can I just say uh, to you, uh, Alistair and Florencia, yes. thank you very much for inviting me. And to all of you, thank you very much for uh, coming along. Um, it's really a, a, a great pleasure and privilege for me to be here on uh, Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening, it is for me. Yes. Um, I've um, had many good times in Argentina. Uh, and in Uruguay and in the other countries around Argentina uh, in the past, though I haven't been there for a few years now. Uh, I'm sure I have met uh, uh, some or even many of you who are here now. So um, a warm hello to you, even if I don't uh, spot your names uh, on this screen, because there's a, a lot of people there. But uh, I remember very good times in Argentina and uh, with the teachers and colleges there. So nice to be with you again. Thank you. Fantastic. Oh, no, thank you. Thank you. Well, um, and, and speaking, speaking of uh, that, Adrian, you, you being in Argentina, we had a, before, before we start, um, apart from having created the Sound Foundation's phonemic chart and being a teacher trainer and being the editor, the series ed editor for the Macmillan Books for Teachers, also something of a musician as well, aren't you? Yes, it's true. Uh, I'm very keen on music and I spend a lot of time playing, though now we can't play in pubs for the time being. No. But I've been uh, playing in pubs with bands of one sort or another since I was a teenager. Um, folk music, blues, Irish music, and uh, in the last uh, 15 years, gypsy jazz, which is something I'm enjoying very much yeah, right now. Wow. Great. Well, actually, one of, one of um, the teachers from here in Argentina uh, sent a, uh, a a fan picture of of you playing a guitar. Here it is. <laughs> where, Goodness me! Um, where, where and when was that? You did a well, recent I photo. Know. I can't remember. Uh, I must say, I have absolutely no idea. I imagine that's a good Argentinian wine on the table there. It, it looks uh, like it. Yeah. <laughs> I can see that the flag behind you. <laughs> who was it? Cecilia Ramirez. Cecilia Ramirez. Thank you, Cecilia. So, yeah, thank oh, you very much. Brilliant. Thank you brilliant. Much. Thank you. Okay, well, look, um, the, the, the publicity for this session I had, um, perhaps unsurprisingly, yeah, used, um, used the phonemic chart as the, as the backdrop for it. Um, and I'm... I'm I'm going to ask you a very basic question to begin with. Uh, the phonemic chart, what would be the difference between that and the phonetic alphabet, for example? Because I must admit, when I started training, I would always get confused between the two. Well, um, the international phonetic alphabet is a set of signs and, and squiggles which um, uh, purports to be able to transcribe more or less any sound from more or less any language. Uh, I'm perhaps exaggerating a little. Uh, and from that, each language extracts uh, the sounds that uh, are, are appropriate for its own um, uh, pronunciation. And that's what happens here. Now, these are the symbols. Uh, I didn't decide which symbols to extract. Essentially, the, the way was led uh, by linguists and by the dictionaries. So these are essentially the ones that are used in today's learners' dictionaries. <clears throat> and um, we, I prefer to call these phonemes rather than phonetic symbols, phonemic symbols rather than phonetic. Okay, uh, so phonemic symbols rather than phonetic. Yes, that's right. This is a phonemic chart, but it is, it's quite true that the symbols are derived from uh, the international phonetic alphabet. <clears throat> Okay, because no, I mean, like we were talking about a couple of minutes ago, um, before before everybody arrived, 
uh, the, the, with the English language teaching degree here in Argentina, I know there's people from all over the world in the room, so which is fantastic. But we've all got a copy of this, which I'm sure you oh, recognise. Yeah. Uh, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, a great yeah. Book. Yeah. <laughs> so, so modest, yeah. Mr. Underhill. <laughs> well, see the movie as well. <laughs> And also written by a very handsome man, I think you would agree. Oh, yeah, well, I don't know who that could be. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a kind of a, like a, a set text here, uh, as it were. Um, but one of the questions that's come up about it is, um, and I'd be fascinated to know your opinion on this, should we introduce, with our, with our learners, is it something that we can and should introduce at a, at a, a low level for example, an A1 or beginner level, or is it, because there is a feeling that perhaps it should be introduced later, like at, at B1, okay. at like intermediate level. Well, a quick answer is, uh, if you have a whiteboard in your classroom, should you introduce that right at the beginning, or should you introduce it later? Uh, the phonetic chart is nothing other than a whiteboard for sounds. And the sounds wow. are there from the beginning. They're not, they don't arrive suddenly later on. Uh, and the need to uh, be able to play around with sounds uh, is there from the beginning. Um, you need the whiteboard for sounds. You can't show them another way. So I would say you need it right from the beginning. I understand that, um, that it, it, behind the question is a sense that it's complicated in some way. Um, mm. Uh, and I think that that is a separate issue that has to do with the way teachers conceive it and what they do with it, because it isn't complicated, it doesn't need to be, but maybe teachers complicate it. Uh, I think that can happen. Right. Um, t tell us a little bit about that. That's very interesting that maybe it can be complicated. In what way? Is it because of what you were saying about perhaps it looking complicated? Sorry, someone's just written in the chat box, teachers can be complicated. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> um, teachers so, can quite true. So yes. it's, not, it's, 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 not, it's not that it's intrinsically complicated in itself, um, but it can be complicated. Is that right? It can be made complicated. Mm -hmm. And the basic point that I go on about and is that pronunciation is a physical activity. And grammar and vocabulary uh, are more or less cognitive activities. I'm exaggerating just to make the point. And if you look through any course book today, you will find a brilliant array of uh, cognitive activities, games, puzzles, problem solving, problem making, which uh, get you to play with the uh, grammar rather like playing with algebra and to play with the vocabulary uh, until you get, uh, you infer or you learn the rules. And this is done cognitively. They're great puzzle books, but, but prawn isn't like that. Prawn is a physical activity. It's nothing like learning grammar. It is more like learning to dance. And learning to dance is not a cognitive activity. Sure, you can talk about it, but that won't help you to, to dance. You need to get into your body and get it moving and get to know your body. Uh, and that is a process of proprioception. Proprioception means knowing what the bits of your body are doing at any given time, especially the muscles. Um, we all have proprioception. When it breaks down, it's, life is very difficult. Uh, and it is with proprioception, that is to say, uh, knowing the bits of our body, uh, and in the case of pronunciation, knowing the bits around here uh, and in the chest, uh, where we make the air pressure, the diaphragm, uh, that's the proprioception. That's the physicality. And um, <clears throat> the basis of uh, pronunciation teaching, as far as I'm concerned, is, uh, uh, is helping students to rediscover, and I say rediscover because they already knew this when they were babies. You, what, those of you with babies who've had babies, you have watched them discovering for themselves uh, their breathing, their muscles, then gradually control over breathing and control over uh, noises, and gradually they start to make a range of different sounds. Uh, and we've seen that evolving. And it comes from inside, it's a physical activity. So, that, uh, go on, go sorry. on. Sorry, no, 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 please. 
I was just going to say, so uh, the area of complication, and I'm, I've just taken a long detour, I'm sorry. The area of complication is that teachers are not seeing that the chart is simply a representation of physicality. They are perhaps seeing it as uh, learning about another cognitive activity on top of everything else, and therefore it seems complicated. To, to learn symbols is amazingly complicated if you don't know what they represent inside. But if you, uh, if you feel inside this sound, gradually you need a name. What is the name of this sound? Well, it's that one there. You know, it, it, it's, I've got my little chart here. You know, it's, oh. it's this <laughs> one here. Or it's this one here. You know, um, they're yeah. just representations for something which is discovered inside. Well, um, one of the things that I read on your uh, on a blog post that you made actually was uh, just about something you were talking. I'm sorry, I'm reading it over here. Um, I've written down um, one of the things that you said was that, and this is going back to what you were saying just now. Teachers need to, um, and the way you'd expressed it was, teachers need to learn their own mouths. Is that the kind of thing you're talking about here? It's exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, there's two kinds of knowledge. One is knowing uh, about sounds, and we get mm. lots of that in all the linguistics books and the teacher training books, which tell us about sounds and show us diagrams and mouths and tongues and movement and all the rest of it and describe it. Uh, and the other is knowing your mouth from the inside. And if a teacher knows her mouth from the inside, it's not very complicated. It's what I do in the first lesson with anybody. Uh, you begin to find that there's not very much going on. There's only two or three, there's only three things that really move. Um, uh, perhaps four, four, four sets of muscles that really move. Um, and <clears throat> you get to know it from the inside. Um, mm. And if a teacher, if a teacher doesn't know what she's doing from the inside, it, she cannot really guide her students to anything. And mm. all she can say is repeat after me, which as we know mm. is, is the stock phrase of our trade. Uh, what the teacher should, if they were really honest, be saying is, look, I don't know what I'm doing, but repeat after me anyway. Um, <laughs> uh, but actually mostly teachers don't say the first bit, they, no. they take the second bit, which is repeat after me. Uh, now, there is some value in repeating after me, some, but uh, very often not a great deal. Uh, what students need to be doing is, is finding the muscles that are going to tweak the difference. And once they've reconnected with the muscles, they actually are connecting with a system which will enable them to make all the sounds of all the languages in the world. And there's only four things you've got to connect with. One is your lips, one is your tongue, one is your jaw. That's three. And the other is your, your voice. There's probably five because there's the push of the lungs. So let's say four or five. <clears throat> okay. Um, yeah, I've got a question for you actually about, about that. Do you speak other languages, Adrian? Yeah, but not well. But, yes. but, but, but I have to say I'm pretty good at getting the pronunciation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, if you can't, who can, for example? No, because I mean, that takes me back to um, the way I learned French at school, which was very sort of grammar translation. And there was a lot of um, répéter, s'il vous plaît, and repeat after me, like that. But um, there wasn't really a focus on, like, I don't know, what you're talking about, about um, learning about your own mouths. Um, well, look. That, Yes. Can, I, can I interrupt you there? I'll just tell you a little story about exactly that. Right. That's me at school learning French. And there's a sound in French, as you all know, which is something like U. Mm. And it is in the word tu, T-U, meaning you. And the teacher would say this sound, U, and we, and we would repeat U which is the ah. mm. and the teacher would say ooh and we say ooh 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 and we could hear it was different but we had no idea what to do no idea <laughs> okay. and the teacher only knew to keep saying it so that we would one day by chance or by luck or by mistake 
uh, say what he wanted. Now, if he had just known that all he had to get us to do was to say uh, the English sound e, mm. e, you can all do that, say E, and then keeping e. the tongue there, pull the lips forward, E, and oh, suddenly okay. you're in the zone of all those U sounds, which are in French and other uh, Scandinavian and other languages. And, and there's no, more than one of them, of course, because once you get in there, you find there's a whole family of them, and they, and you, but you know how to do them all because they are lips forward, tongue forward. Now, English doesn't do that for anything. But uh, the, once you've done that, you, there's only one habit you've got to break. And you won't break it by the teacher keeping saying that because the student keeps saying, they don't know how to break their habit. How mm. do you break a habit when you're eight years old? Uh, yeah, when you're six months or one year, you, you're still in with the muscles. You can do anything. But later you can't because it settles and it becomes habituated. And that's fine because you have other things to learn. You can't keep everything open. Things have to become habituated. So we come to the second language, or it's the third for some people. You've got to get behind the habit. You cannot repeat your way out of a habit. And yet even to this day, our methodology says keep repeating. Uh, and, with, and turns a blind eye to the fact that it hardly works. Mm, that's, that's fascinating. <laughs> so, it's, sorry, go on. No, no, that's all I, <laughs> I finished. <laughs> no, uh, so what you're, one of the things you're saying in essence is that there's, if in fact it, it will be a good idea for teachers to exploit the, the sounds that are made in, in, their, in their mother tongue, in their first language as it were, in order to lead them to relatively unfamiliar sounds in the L2. Well, all that my teacher had to do, my story was an illustration of your question, the teacher needs to know his mouth. And all he had to do, and this is what I say to teachers everywhere of any language, all he had to do was to say the target sound, which in this case was U. Mm -hmm. Say the starting sound where we were, which was OO, and move slowly between them and see what he did inside. Mm. Then he would know what he's trying to get us to do. And then because he's a teacher and he's smart and he's intelligent and, he's, and into all that stuff, he could set about doing it. But until he knows what he's trying to get us to do, everyone's wasting their time and repeat after me doesn't you know, it doesn't work. So uh, that, that it's that there's a, just a little story to say why a teacher needs to know their mouth. And it's terribly, terribly simple. Yes. And it also will bring to mind a question that was asked um, by one of the participants, uh, Ro Diedrichs. She said, how relevant is it to teach the phonemic chart now that it's so easy to hear the pronunciation of a word, even in different accents, by simply Googling it? And I think that that's to some extent. Great, it's a great question. And the answer is, uh, I've never in my life taught the phonemic chart. I wouldn't dream of it. You don't teach a whiteboard, you just use it. I don't teach the phonemic chart, I, I, I use it because um, on the, you know, students say to me, uh, how do I catch the sound of an English? It's, uh, I can see the word, it's on the paper, I see the grammar, it's in, it's in a book. How do I catch a sound? I hear it and it's gone. I catch it in my hand and I open my hand and there's nothing there anymore. How do I catch an English sound? And the only is one way of catching it and that is to uh, rearrange your musculature in ways which will be slightly unfamiliar, that's why it's a foreign sound, uh, just as a, a new dance movement is unfamiliar until you're used to it. Um, and that's why dance is a good analogy. Uh, you, you, uh, uh, you find a slightly different muscular uh, uh, configuration and then the teachers, uh, and you need feedback. And it's the teacher who says, yeah, you're close. That's pretty close. In fact, that's so close that I'm going to say, you've got it. And it's here, by the way. You don't need to learn that symbol. You don't need to know nothing other than I'm saying what you've just done, that physical arrangement you just did, it's here. And mm -hmm. actually, you'll get better at it but for the time being, it's good enough for me to say, here is where you've got to. Now, that's really something. That's not learning the chart. That's the student saying, ah, right. So what I just did is close, and it's close enough to need a name. Now, we don't give them names like Andrew and, and Bertie. We 
point and say, you're there. It could be a color, it could be a picture, or in this case, it's a squiggle. It doesn't really matter. Or right. it could be an empty box, but it would always be the same empty box. Yes, mm. yes, yeah. And um, you, see, you see, you it's impossible to learn the names of things you have not met. Do you understand that? Mm. You are te all of you are teachers. You've got 30 new students in your class. You can't learn their names before you meet them. You read the names, but you can't learn them. And once you've met them for a few lessons, their names just fall into place. You don't even learn them. It's exactly the same with sounds. You cannot possibly learn the sounds unless you have got your muscles around them and you can feel yourself doing something different and you can hear through your ears that it's different from that thing in your mother tongue. And now all you need is a name for it, just as you need names for your 30 students. You want the names. You don't learn them. They fall into place because you need them so badly. Because you can't just have 30 students hanging around without names. Uh, it's the same here. That muscular movement, it needs some kind of reference out in the world. And here's a very compact way of doing it. There's a thousand ways of doing it. It could do it with objects around my room. And that actually works perfectly well. You could put, with, you, with kids, you could put their lunch boxes in a certain arrangement. And that works perfectly well. Or their shoes or something. But actually, the thing that's truly portable is this. Mm. Right. Um, well, one thing I wanted to ask connected to that, obviously, is about um, the because many teachers are very concerned with teaching the, and I'm going to do the classic finger inverted comma thing, the correct way to pronounce something. Um, is there a correct way to pronounce it? I mean, this, I suppose, has to do with accents as well, to a certain extent. Um, well, so, okay, so what's your question? So, if there is a for example, a, a correct way to pronounce things, um, or like, like you were saying, is it close enough? Um, like you were pointing on the chart, if, if someone's got things, if a student has got something, uh, has got to a state close enough. I suppose this is about intelligibility, for example. Like, is it enough to be intelligible? Or um, like someone's just put in the chat box, intelligibility is the goal. Um, I suppose I don't know whether intelligibility is different relative to the to the speaker or the listener or the or the accent. Okay, so there's several things here. One is intelligibility. One is accent. And mm -hmm. I think you started off by saying, "Is there a correct pronunciation?" Did you? Yeah. Sorry, I've asked you three questions in one. Yeah, at least, <laughs> at least three. At least three. And yeah. uh, you're trying to get me confused, which is not <laughs> hard. I'm, I'm, I'm a bit confusing myself, Adrian. Don't worry. Um. Let's begin, uh, can you remember those three? Because I'll forget them. Let's begin with, is there a correct sound? Well, with all of these things, correctness is, is relative. Um, so um, our beginning student makes a sound that I think, yeah, that's close enough. And I'm going to show you that it's this one, which is uh, the English sound E. Actually, it's not, it's not, it will get better. And perhaps uh, a, few, a few days later, I play a little game where, I don't know if you can see this, I might point at, uh, at the edge of the box or I might point in the center. And for that lesson, I make a difference between uh, what you're doing and what you could do, which is even closer. And perhaps I get you to listen to, uh, not necessarily myself, but something on the tape that we were playing with. And you can hear. And I've up, what I've done is I've upped the game. It's not that you were incorrect. I've just upped the game. And I've asked for more because now you're ready for more and you're more discerning. And actually you're engaged by being asked for more. You don't think, oh, no, not more. You, you are a learning organism. And if I get it right, you're, you're encouraged by that. So uh, the correct, correctness is a kind of moving target. It also, of course, you've got correctness in your syllabus or the Ministry of Education or somebody may say, well, this is the correct accent and this is the less correct accent. Um, <clears throat> what I do, I, first of all, I say teachers teach the way you speak. That's number one. Whatever it is, teach the way you speak. Number two, 
while you're doing that, expose students to loads of other accents, which is now so easy to do through the internet. And get mm -hmm. your students to say, you know, uh, okay, now, uh, could you make that sentence in American? Let's just be mm. generalized. Excuse me. No, go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. Hey, where have you gone? So, um, it related to that, because I'm, I'm, I'm back there. Sorry, I, I, I'm back there. <laughs> okay. No, one of the, I'm going to read a, a question that one of the teachers has literally just written in the chat box directly connected to that. Angie Salazar has said, "What about input? Most of our teaching resources are British English books, and most media the students have access to is American English. That's certainly the case here in Argentina, for example." Um, and she says many sounds, even tone patterns, differ between the accents. Um, so I suppose maybe the question might be: Is is there one? Should one be teaching British English or American English, or is it not about well, that? What I do is teach them all. Um, once you've got into your muscles, uh, we can start to choose. Excuse me, I'm going to have to do this. This is all right. Go ahead, Alice. Yeah, I'll send you back a bit later. I'm just online in the interview at the moment. All right, there's not that many people here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, speak soon. Yes, sure, yes. Hang on a sec. Wait a minute. Okay. So, in the meantime, we can see that Adrian has a beautiful guitar in the background, and we were really hoping that he was going to play a song for us, but <laughs> when we were speaking to him with the sound check, he said he, said he might not, actually unfortunately so um uh, but we might we might now get a song out of adrian um so okay you're right that's all right all, all sorted uh, that was my daughter on the phone so okay no. uh, she, she's speaking to her mum now right okay. now um right. american accents Look, yes you, um, you, on. once you're in touch with the muscles uh we can say to we can ask a student change it a bit that sound change it a bit that accent that uh the emphasis change it a bit the stress change it a bit make it a bit longer make it a bit short we can start to tweak and play with things uh i can say uh okay uh, you just said that with an american accent everybody make it sound american now make it sound british play with those two uh um i can say to people um what in the end people can choose their accent so i can say uh find your uh your favorite uh, uh rapper or your favorite singer or your favorite movie actor at the moment uh go online tonight for homework and learn one line in their accent and come back with it tomorrow they can do it anyone can do it it's fun it's engaging it's not learning pronunciation it's it's playing with life and um in this you know or i can say to my students yeah you're right your other teacher of english she speaks differently from me now say it like her cool now say it like me cool and they may not be exactly right but they get the idea and it's just simply playfulness mm. um and i can say look uh, as you all know this accent is the one that's going to get you through the exam so that's the game we're going to play mm. Uh, okay. But while we're playing that game, in order to really sharpen what that accent is, we're going to play with all the other accents which it isn't. Mm. So we'll also then be zipping out of uh, accent, the pass accent, let us say it might be British English, I don't know, but let's say it is, uh, uh, or, or RP or something like that. Uh, and we'll, we'll test out other accents, not just regional accents, but we'll go around the world. Uh, there's lots of lovely little two minute tours of the world in, with English accents and two minute tours of the States and so on. I, I indulge in those. It's not such a big deal. Students can do it. Um, once they have connected with the muscles and they see that what it is is just tiny, tiny little movements of only essentially three things, lips, jaw or tongue. Mm. Well, um, one of the, the teachers, and I literally just mentioned in the chat box now, um, why British or American English? What about other Englishes? And there's yeah. something I want to ask about that is that... Um, there's a couple of things. Firstly, somebody had somebody had asked um, about, I think it was uh, Lucia Bengochea Paz from Uruguay, 
um, she had asked a teacher there, she'd said, um, what, is there such a thing as an, an ESOL accent, for example? Sorry, I'm reading it as we're talking. Um, is it that we should, okay, we've already discussed not sticking necessarily with one accent, but the, there's plenty of people who, um, you know, neither have a British, British or North American or Australian or etc. but they have, I'm going to call it in, uh, what she said, an, an ESOL accent, um, an, an English teacher accent almost. Um, and they, they, what I'm trying to say is they, they don't, they're not subscribing to one or the other and presumably that's, that's okay. Of course it's okay. Uh, and what I think is most okay of all is to say to students and help them to see that it's true that they can, to a large degree, choose their accent. Uh, if they're not interested, it's much more difficult. But if they become interested, and at a certain age, kids are interested in all sorts of lifestyle statements, an accent is one of them. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, this links to something else, which is, um, I mean, it, 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 I'm sure it's the case for all of you. Teenagers have got their own way of speaking, and mm. different uh, uh, accents in English become um, fashion statements mm -hmm. as much as anything at different times. Um, so um, the glottalization, uh, you know, of tea becomes, is not just where you grew up, it's also a fashion statement by kids at a certain age and it becomes perhaps adults at a certain age, I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. That's very interesting. So. Are you, are you saying in a way that like what you're, you're talking about with kids, because I think probably, uh, probably the vast majority of teachers here in the room with us today teach younger learners that yeah. they might change their accent a bit, even native speakers change their accent a bit to be cool, as it were, or... Of course, of yes. course. Uh, and if you can do it to be cool, uh, mm. you, you know, that... <laughs> um, so th there's, there's this big... Uh, um, argument that's mostly made by teachers uh, which is is it um, uh, my students uh, don't want to change their accent because they feel they're losing themselves and therefore I don't want to push them hmm. now uh, I challenge that because um, I think that is uh, a cover-up for a defeat in a different area, what the teacher is saying uh, is that I myself don't know what to do and I myself cannot help my student to feel uh, confident and interested in this. Um, mm. And <clears throat> I think that if the thing is uh, introduced, if students find that um, they can uh, uh, the, 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 through entering uh, uh, the physicality, they can alter the sounds. If they find that they can go away for homework, come back with uh, the same sentence in a, in a different accent because they've watched a movie of their fam favorite star or something. Mm. Um, and if we're saying to students, uh, you, um, you can feel the accent from inside, you, you, you uh, you, you can speak how you want, but for the moment, play this game. Um, <clears throat> I think the teachers, uh, I think there's something else at work. I think that, that students can find that, uh, um, yes, they have got their own accent, and we can say to them, okay, could you make it in that, other, that, that English accent? Now could you make it in your own accent? Now could you make it in that English accent again? Yeah, now make it in your own. All the class, make it in your own accent. Now all the class, playfully, make it in that English accent. Yeah, cool, good. Uh, so mm -hmm. we're not trying to get them to jettison their accent. We're getting mm -hmm. them to be fluent at passing from one to the other and even making it a kind of game. And not mm -hmm. only from one to the other, but from one to many others, of which but one of them is going to get them through the exam because that's the one that the Ministry of Education decided on. And even that's a game. So yes, quite. So there's an aspect of, I was gonna say fake it till you make it. I don't quite mean that. I mean, I really like what you're just saying about the, them finding their own accent, like they're finding their own voice within yeah. a second language. So it's not that they, 
Um, I mean, for example, some, I will say, someone has just written in capital letters in the chat box, our students are Argentinians. So what I'm gonna, <laughs> something I'm gonna point out about that is that um, I suppose there are a myriad of different Englishes, as it were. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's, you know, there's, 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 there's Indian English, it, uh, to a certain extent, you can probably say there's, how can I put this, there's River Plate English as well yeah. here in South America. Um, and so I like, I very much like what you're saying about them finding their own voice, finding their own accent. So not necessarily, you know, aping, as it were, imitating Hugh Grant or Brad Pitt, yes. or whatever. Yeah, that's right. You don't have to sound like Brad Pitt, you don't have to sound like Hugh Grant, but for this game, uh, mm -hmm. choose one sentence from that Hugh Grant movie that we've just been looking at, and one that you really like, and come in, and in a playful and hilarious way, see if you can sound more like him than he does. <laughs> you know. And then do it, and then, and then take exactly those same words and make it sound like uh, Trump, or make it sound like someone from Texas, or whatever is, is within the, the scope of their knowledge, or make it sound like me, or make it sound like your other teacher, or, or uh, t tell me someone in your family that speaks English a bit. Now make it sound like her, maybe your grandmother, make it sound like her. You know, people can move around in accents, and once they, they do that, uh, it just takes boldness, and uh, they're not going to lose themselves, they're gaining themselves. <clears throat> I like that. I like, you're saying a lot of very good quote-worthy things here, Adrian. I like that. They're not, exactly. not going to lose themselves, they're gaining themselves. What was that? Well, then we've got a question. Oh, we just lost it. Uh, if someone was asking about English changing and the sound of English changing, what do you yeah. think about yeah. it? Well, it is changing, and, uh, you know, uh, all languages are, and when you look back uh, over the as you all know very well, if you look back at uh, uh, radio programmes or TV programmes, the most famous, of course, is the Pathé News programmes from the wartime. That's uh, uh, 70 years ago. And then you can hear a very marked change. So all languages have changed. The Queen's Speech, has, has, which has been recorded for, uh, you know, 60, 70 years, we know that that's changing. Everything changes. Yeah, of course it changes. It, it does. Mm. And, and uh, perhaps uh, accents since the, we are more an international community, people are traveling more, at least by internet, uh, gradually accents are getting rounded off at the edges. Um, and we are all getting ears for each other's accents. <clears throat> oh, that doesn't make sense. Um, so what, what would you say, if you had to say the most important issue as regards pronunciation for people learning another language, um, what should they focus on the most? Well, the, fir the, the first is, and you can't get away from it at all, uh, and all the methods that don't pay attention to it fail, uh, and that is the physicality. And it's no good just lecturing students saying, oh, this is the tongue, and this is the mouth. It's nothing to do with the lecture, but it's nothing to do with the cognitive knowledge, it's to do with getting inside. You've got to get inside and find the muscles. Mm. And, you know, that's terribly, terribly simple to do. I do it with my demonstrations, just do it in the first half hour. Uh, when playing with the vowels, they discover all, all the muscles. Or I could say um, to my students on the first day, look, imagine, uh, if, this is for all of you right now, uh, find your tongue and stick it out and wave it about. I can see some of you are not doing this. Okay, I I'm doing it. I, I'm watching all of you, by the way. <laughs> Come on, everybody, stick your tongues yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I say, look, imagine that your, your tongue is a leaf in the, on a tree in a forest, okay? So your tongue is being blown around by the wind in this forest, and your tongue touches some trees, and these trees are in a circle around there, and they're also called teeth, eh? and, and your tongue touches, can you feel that these, these trees are in a circle? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is an amazing forest because there's some trees growing down from the sky and you'll find some trees pointing down from the top. Mm, oh yeah. Can you find them with the tip of your leaf? Oh yeah. And behind those trees, there's some hard sky. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. And the sky curves away. Can you find that? Mm, yeah. Get your leaf to go right to the back mm. and you'll find a kind of 
soft, boggy, wet bit at the back at the top. It's a strange forest, this. And at the back of the sky, there's this bog. Oh, oh yeah. Now, let your leaf come forward. And uh, b behind the trees at the front, there's another soft, boggy bit. Ah, oh, yeah. 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 And at the front of this forest, there's a window. And if you open it, uh, the light will come in. Mm. And the sounds will come out. Now, we've just taken the students on a tour around the mouth. And it may be the first time that they put their mind into the proprioception of the mouth. And that is the terrain, just that small terrain, millimeter by millimeter, is where all the sounds of all the languages come from. I love that. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I love the analogy. I think it's Especially brilliant. Young Love well, yes, I, but I think I think also like um, getting like you're saying both students and the teachers to explore their their own mouths, explore their own articulators. So yeah, yeah, it's exactly that. And we don't use any Latin words, no Greek words, no medical words, no nothing. Just a, a hand. You know, the words for getting around the mouth are the same words as moving around a room and putting things on tables and taking them away. You know, a handful of prepositions, a handful of verbs, and uh, one or two nouns. It's so simple. Fantastic. Uh, so, you know... Yes. Uh, this, this brings us in a way on to... Um, sorry, to can I just, the second part of the question, uh, you said yeah. what's important. Well, physicality mm. is it because sound is muscles and if you're not in connection with the muscles you won't get anywhere or mm. you won't get nowhere as the americans would say now um <clears throat> the second thing which i think is very important for english is to get the sounds to a to a good enough and then straight away to start working on the distribution of energy across the utterance. That is the key thing. Perhaps that's key for all languages, but anyway, that's key for English. And English is very different from, for example, Spanish in the way energy is distributed. So in English, we have got to have, as I'm just saying that we've got to have these long syllables, which have a lot of energy and for them to do that, there's got to be these tiny syllables which have disappeared. Mm. And that means no energy. So the distribution of energy has to do with energizing and de-energizing. And that lungs are needed for that. So the lung muscles have got to get used to that in a way which Spanish, uh, in a way which Spanish is different. And so uh, when you're coming, let us say, from Spanish to English, uh, you, you need the sounds to be good enough but after that it is a matter of connecting the stuff together and most of all it's the distribution of energy uh, so that would be my second answer to, to, to your question right um what this is making me think of um encouraging students in this way is making me think uh, quite a lot of demand high teaching which um some people in the room might not be that familiar with relative to your other work with the phonemic chart. Um, could you tell us just a, a, a tiny bit about what demand high teaching involves? Well, it's just an approach which I think is open to, which all good teachers probably do in any case, but we just, myself and Jim Scrivener just took a, a few ideas. What we're saying is, um, can we can students aim higher? Can we demand more? Is it actually fun to be m more deeply engaged and trying harder? How would we go about that? Is, is it enough to be doing the tasks in course books? Is it enough to let the tasks do the teaching? Now, none of us would admit to doing that, but is that what course books in the end may have us end up doing that we are so pushed for time there's so much stuff in the course books and anyway the activities aren't that bad so we end up not teaching but uh, managing tasks um and maybe even that's fashionable today i don't know but is that enough and uh, demand high teaching is asking this question and um so we have come up with a number of things i'll just give you two or three examples one is uh whenever you're doing a coursework activity what we call kqc keep questions cooking and keep questions cooking means 
find uh, you ask the question, which is any any typical question the teacher asks, which is to do with let's say a comprehension text or something, and uh, instead of having the art the teacher's question extinguished by the first correct answer, collect answers around the room. You know this. Collect. Okay. So what do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Uh, that's different from that. Is that the same as that? Okay. So how how many have we got now? In other words, see what's in the room, collect it. And people are then listening to even get people to say it clearer, even and it may be the wrong answer, but get it to get it well said, upgrade everything, uh, collect what's in the room. And then as a second bit, after a moment, after a few moments, say, OK, so we've got five different possible answers. This one, this one, this one. Um, uh, um, now let's look at those. And the next question comes, well, let's now discriminate between the two or three that we've got. So in other words, uh, people in the room, the students, are uh, stating exactly where they are. The teacher's playing with them, saying, OK, you said that. Who agrees with that? Who wants to change that? Who wants to say something different? We've got another thing over here. In other words, keep questions cooking. Don't let the question get extinguished by the first correct answer. Otherwise, everybody learns nothing. A second demand high activity would be... Um, <clears throat> what we call upgrading so in other words uh and this is really relevant to pronunciation instead of thinking correction you think upgrade now uh, uh every utterance that a student makes can be upgraded and even if the correct words are in the correct order which is what teachers often call correct uh you can say yeah correct okay you got the correct words in correct order but now could you upgrade it in, in other words now uh, um um join the words together make it faster make it slower make it clearer where is the stress um there's a word missing you know so even when the words are uh, the right words are there upgrade it and here is where pronunciation is such a fantastic advantage because no one has ever got the perfect pronunciation there's always something that can be done um and it may well be will you make that nice and slow so that it's really super clear now you've got that could you speed it up uh and you uh could you make the contrast between the stresses and the other stresses better and always there's work to be done in pronunciation and every time people are working on pronunciation they are of course uh, um, working on the repetitions of the uh, structure and the vocabulary. So upgrading is brilliant because you do not need a mistake to upgrade. Mm. So everyone is in the same boat. Over here, smarty pants, who's always got everything right, we upgrade we, everything she says, we upgrade her. This, mm. this kid over here, who's always got a mistake, that's fine too because we just, the upgrade for him involves correcting the mistake. The upgrade for her involves making it faster. Uh, this kid here is listening to her trying to do it faster and, and realizes that she's having as much trouble with that as he's having with that. Mm. You know, so everybody has got some cooking to be done. So that's called upgrading. Uh, there are others that I won't go into, but those are two examples of mm. demand high. And underneath all of that is a fundamental belief, which you may or may not share, which is that we are human beings and social beings and we are learning beings we are designed to learn. learning is what we are for and that uh, you don't need motivation to learn learning is lovely we love learning it gets screwed up uh, uh, by all sorts of things that is a problem but at heart we love learning we are learning beings and if we can tap into that if we can catch that if the, if the teacher is themselves enthusiastic enough about learning itself the human in in progress not just getting the test result the, mm -hmm. the test result will come from a human in progress that's the fun thing and all humans like that so uh, demand high is also kind of thinking uh people there's uh teachers say oh i'm humanistic and you say to them what does that mean because I, I like this idea and they say something which surprises me they say oh i don't ask them for too much homework oh i don't correct them too much oh i i, I don't push them very hard because life is difficult and i say well, what are you doing then you know <laughs> I'm, I'm not asking you to be an ogre or something or some you know 
wolf that gobbles people up. I'm saying, give them a challenge that will make their life worth living. Now, here, with this text in this classroom. I love that. I really, <laughs> you've said a lot of wonderful things just now. I really love the idea of upgrading. Um, it reminds me of Selinka's ideas about interlanguage, that there is a, you know, a, a level that students are on. It doesn't mean that they have a low level or a high level or whatever. It's all there for upgrading. I love that idea. Yeah. Um, really do. So everyone, ne never will you have students waiting bored while, other, while the poor ones, slow ones are struggling. You, you push everybody equally. Mm. Always. And that's, this is one place where pronunciation is, is a great saviour. That's great because you just made me think about because one of the big issues that we, we have. Um, we work here in Argentina. I'm sure there's people in this room who are, we, we know actually from all over the world. But um, the, an issue with differentiation. And I think what you're talking about yes. is super helpful with differentiation. Because this is, this is yeah. super moment by moment differentiation, which never fails. It cannot fail. It can't fail. Um, and what it means is that everyone in the class is working on something. And I can say to her, say it slow. I'll be back in a moment. You say it faster. You get the words in the right order. You, you need to take a word out. See if you can figure it out. You, there's a word missing. Figure it out. And you, who've, you've got everything so nice. I want you please to say exactly the same thing with different words. Uh, everyone's working. Yeah, no, I love everyone's it. Everyone's interested it. in what the others are going to come out with too. Yes. And everyone's challenged as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 But to a doable list, so it's something that they can actually achieve. Right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. This um, is a, a demand high means giving everyone a, a doable demand. Perfect. A doable for them. Would you say it's like the optimal doable? What would you say is the optimal? doable demand how can we measure that is it like by knowing each student it's by it, my job as a teacher is to learn the students their job is to learn the language uh, so i am uh observing and learning the students and sensing what each one can do and how much i can push them and how to push them and how to push them in a way which is fun and enjoyable and worthwhile and in their reach and how after uh, a minute or two or five to enable each student to feel a real personal mm -hmm. success i think what you've just said um about this this the, the, the students are learning the language our job is to learn the students. You didn't, I paraphrased you very badly, but they learn the language, we learn the students. I love the concept. I think an, an issue that, I, that, that can be had by teachers, I'm gonna use the passive voice, is that there is um, a worry or uh, a focus on, you know, getting through the students, through the syllabus, through yeah. the exam, et cetera, et cetera. And there is often less of a focus on um, rapport with students and learning about the students and I think what you have just said that one of the things we, we learn the students and it's wonderful really I think that, 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 that makes such a difference in terms it, of teaching. It does and, and it, it, the, the trouble is that relationship and rapport is not really central to mm. our methodology but it mm. should be because if all of you that are listening now think back for a moment to your favorite teacher when you were a kid or an adolescent and the teacher that really did something for you that made a difference and who you still remember and feel grateful to today uh, and I say well write down please or tell me what is the quality of her or him and in nine times out of ten you won't be writing down methodological qualities or even topic qualities you'll be writing down interpersonal qualities and that's Definitely. what you remember and that's what did it for that's you. so true isn't it? yes absolutely. that is so true well look um i'm gonna reshare the screen now because um we're, we're coming up to to time but um do you, do you recognize this adrian uh wait just a little thing i don't know whether you, whether oh, you can see yes. this is this is the underhill family crest this is slightly <laughs> game of thrones style oh, and nice. um how oh, quite extraordinary. Yeah, I don't know whether you knew this. I'm not going to attempt to pronounce it in Latin, um, um, but apparently, go on. 
Uh, yes, it is true. I, I've not seen the ever looking upwards, but the family crest has always been, uh, as I've known it, vive et am I, in Latin, live and love. Right, um, and live and um, love. Uh, I have a crest. That's somewhere there. <laughs> Oh, fantastic. Oh, it's, it's, well, look at that. It's, it's oh, almost wow. exciting. Well, listen, the, the, the reason I wanted to ask you about this was if, if this is apparently your, your family uh, motto, as it were, um, live and love, as you've got there, what would be your motto as a teacher? Oh, crikey, you put me on the spot. <laughs> I'd put you right on the spot. I'm going to ask everyone to write theirs as well. What would yours be, your, your motto as a teacher? Yes, challenge yourself. Challenge yourself, okay. That's a good one. I think it's something, well, one thing would be uh, be on the same side of the learning fence as your students. I like that. Be on the same side of the learning fence as your students. We're all learning. We've written down all these things you said today. Oh, my God, it's my <laughs> <It's> favorite. Fantastic. <laughs> okay, and um, some final things just to wrap up. Three, three yeah. questions for you, okay? Um, okay. My secret to motivating students is what? What would you say? What would be the, the first thing that came into your head? Uh, to love life. That's, that's, yeah, I think that uh, what you were just saying about uh, learning the students as well really resonates with that. Okay, what do you hope quarantine will have taught us about teaching? Well, I, uh, I've been doing some talks recently on what I call kitchen table teaching because everyone has been teaching from home, very often from a kitchen table or bedroom or, or, or sitting room. And the kitchen table is a place where you have friends and you talk about what matters and uh, serious and trivial. And you don't teach, you are kind of host. So I've been thinking about hosting lessons around the kitchen table, where around the kitchen table you are yourself, you're not this professional mask, you are yourself. And you go into the, the, the rooms by Zoom of, of your students who are also at their kitchen tables and we're all together around kitchen tables. I think that's brilliant. Let's do that in the classroom as well. Okay, one more for you. If I could give one piece of advice uh, to the teacher, to teachers these days, it would be, what would it be? Uh, I think it would be, um, I don't know, I think it would be listen, listen to them. Wonderful. Um, really, I'm, I'm sure everyone will agree that you've said some truly mind-blowing things this afternoon or this morning or where, where, where everyone else is from. Um, so so thank, thank you very, very much indeed. Um, uh, we just need to say thank you, don't we, to um, Advice, uh, because I really want to say thank you to Advice, um, who Advice Digital have provided the platform for today. In fact, for all, we're all in this together meeting. So thank you so much for that and for all the help and support that you're giving to teachers during this time. Um, it's, it's really wonderful. Is there anything you'd like to ask, Good. Oh, you've Adrian? Got well, thank you very much, and uh, I think We're All This Together is a brilliant title, uh, uh, and we are, and we always were, actually. Yes. Uh, um, and one of the things that might come out of all this is that we realise again, and perhaps more fundamentally, that we are, and that we can actually do something about it this time around, mm -hmm. and, and build a world that's a bit less ridiculous than the one we've been making so far. Here, mm. <laughs> here, here, here. Well, um, thank you so very, very much, Adrian, for n not only being here, um, because it's immensely generous um, and it's made, it makes such, such a difference. Um, and e I want to thank everybody who is uh, there in the room at the moment. Thank you so much for coming, everybody. Um, we can see all of you out there. It's been, been fantastic for you being here. And uh, for us I'd just like to add to that. Uh, yes. And remember, teachers are very important people. Not everybody thinks so, but we know that. Uh, we're not paid, but we know that we are very important. And, uh, you know, we should carry on w w with that in mind, knowing that. No, that's, that's, that's definitely true. And I think, I hopefully, Adrian, I'm sure everyone in the room will agree as well, that one of the things that I hope, I hope, touch wood, <laughs> that uh, quarantine will have taught everybody is that teachers really are very important, hardworking people. Um, yeah. we, we are teaching the future one way or another. So. Cool, absolutely.
Well, um, thank you very much yet again, Adrian. Um, and uh, I, I don't know what to say. It's been, it's been a delight, honestly. Thank you so much. Likewise. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye. Right. Round of applause for Adrian. Thank you. All right. Well, I shall say goodbye to everyone. We'll all say goodbye. Enjoy the rest of your mornings, afternoons, Thanks. evenings, etc. And I hope to see you again soon, Adrian. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Good luck to all of you. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. 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 See you next Sunday.